觉享受的极致。Discovery 频道，开拓您的世界。In this program, you will see professional magicians and performers who, after years of practice, are able to accomplish tricks and illusions that are extremely dangerous. Please do not try these at home. For centuries, magic has amazed and horrified audiences with dangerous illusions. Countless lovely assistants have been mutilated, sawn, and beheaded in the name of entertainment, at least by appearance. One of the oldest death-defying tricks is the Indian sword basket. A girl is placed in a flimsy wicker basket. Swords and spears are then thrust through it. Danger, or implied danger, is a powerful attraction for those in search of a vicarious thrill. Magicians always happily give the public what they want, and in the process, they explore the primal fears within all of us. This is danger that is ultimately safe. I see this, and yet I know deep down everything is really safe. The magician isn't putting the sword through the assistant. He's not really sawing her in half. It looks that way. And there might be stage blood all over the stage. But in magic, things are not always what they seem. My partner, Penn, and I have always admired the honeybee. We think it's a beautiful thing uh, for the same reasons that, uh, that you find it in classical literature. You know, I think this is one of the epilogues devoted to, to beekeeping. Uh, the bee is a very lovely kind of animal to have on the planet, and we thought that it would be nice to do something with bees. Uh, and the only plot that we could think of was we thought that we should parody the way magicians uh, vaunt their, their, their power by producing live tigers, by producing a hundred thousand uh, apparently dangerous animals. Well, you want wild animals? We got wild animals. Power, build a tila. Zwei, drei, vier, six, seven. Okay, so they're not Bengal tigers, but they are aliens, six-legged, hairy monsters capable of injecting your flesh with a deadly poison. Yes? They're bees. Aware that a sting in the eye can cause blindness and that multiple stings can be deadly, Penn and Teller took every precaution to make this trick safe. So we went to an allergist who incidentally declined to be named in any publicity because he didn't think this was exactly a legitimate thing for an allergist to do. But the allergist tested us for the stings of every kind of stinging insect. Neither of us had a serious allergy to it. But I know what you're thinking. You're saying to yourself, yeah, but Sigmund and Leroy put in this little... This is a routine that's genuinely dangerous. And meanwhile, of course, Penn and Teller are definitely performing their magic tricks throughout. Let's do a number equal to every tiger Sigmund and Leroy ever produced. There we go. There's for all the ones they produced other times. And what about all the little bunnies and doves and kittens that they ever pulled out of anywhere? I think we've covered six. We have to go step by step with these things. Position. We began by wearing full beekeeper suits with the hoods, with the full garments, with the thick gloves. And uh, 
we got in and got used to the idea of the bees being around us, and we noted their behavior. And their behavior was that they never stung unless they were squished. While we're at it, let's go with Blackstone. You got your, you got your Copperfield, you got your Thurston, you got your Kreskin. Now, I know what you're thinking, Kreskin's a mentalist, but I'm sure he pulled a bunny or two in his life. And besides, this bee right here reads minds at least as well as Kreskin. How about all the amateur magicians? Here's the amount of animals produced by all the amateur magicians in North America. And then we tried it without the beekeeper suits. And then we tried it without the gloves, but we discovered that if we didn't seal around our cuffs, bees would crawl in, and crawling in under the cuff is a, a dangerous sort of thing because the bee can get trapped, panic, and sting you. Ouch! Okay, we got South America, we got, ooh, there's Antarctica. Every animal produced in Antarctica is stinging me, right next to Greenland. And we also got Europe and Africa covered here. Tell us Europe and Africa on my, Europe and Africa. And what about Australia? We'll put another bee on the Barbie. Now, I can't say that in the heat of performance, we didn't get a few stings. Uh, I, I got one somewhere on my scalp. I think that was about the time that I was dumping a large container, I think a, a top hat full of bees on my head. No, it was a pot. It was a pot of bees that I was dumping on my head. We have one million bees in this. Okay, it's not a million bees, it's more like 100,000 bees. It's still more animals than produced by all the magicians. Okay, now it's a million bees. You know, Penn's very animated, and I think during the course of his, his animation, he got stung some 20 or 24 times, uh, which is not pleasant. Uh, he, my, my favorite of his things, of course, was that he was talking so enthusiastically that one actually flew into his mouth, got trapped, and stung him on the roof of his mouth. Uh, the only reaction he had was that his, well, how shall I say, his all right, I'll say it. His, his scrotum swelled up, and he very proudly showed it around backstage. There's another kind of animal we want to do, too, and that is a rabbit out of a hat. There's nothing at all scary about a rabbit, is there? Well, how about this rabbit, huh? I wonder how many children watching tonight are going to be talking about that to a court-appointed psychiatrist. The most famous magician of all time, Harry Houdini, earned his place in history as a daredevil performer of extremely dangerous tricks. Neither Houdini nor Penn and Teller ever performed dangerous tricks. When you hear of Houdini escaping from a packing crate that's been, was tossed off a bridge, well, had you actually seen the event, it wasn't tossed off the bridge. It was gingerly and carefully lowered into the water because Houdini left no concern for safety unattended to. You'd be mad to do it. Art is not about real danger. Art's about make-believe. And anyone who allows real danger in art is deeply immoral. In the 70 years since Houdini's death, many inaccurate and misleading claims have been made about his exploits. Only a few first-person accounts, along with some fragments of newsreels and films, can bear witness to the truth behind the Houdini legend. Virtually everything that anyone said or wrote about Houdini, and certainly anything that he said or wrote about himself, needs to be questioned. I think that the vast majority of Houdini's escapes required physical strength, agility, endurance, and athletic ability more than overcoming any real severe element of danger. Properly performed under the predictable plan circumstances he had devised, there was relatively little danger. The gathered crowd was unable to see a safety rope attached to Houdini's ankle. So great were his skills as a showman that not one of the thousands of people below ever suspected that Houdini was in fact in no danger at all. But some of his tricks were truly dangerous. His Chinese water torture cell escape was the trick in Houdini's show that carried the greatest risk. A reinforced glass box resembling a phone booth was filled with 250 gallons of cold water. 
Houdini, securely fastened by his ankles and handcuffed, would then be lowered headfirst into the water. The torture cell was securely locked and covered. Eyewitness reports claim that Houdini would remain underwater as long as five minutes before escaping and revealing himself to the frenzied audience. Only a handful of modern performers have ever even attempted this escape. We decided to do a, a version of Houdini's water torture cell. So we rehearsed that and, and built the props and, and we taped it. Uh, and it was a very uh, bad idea, I think, <laughs> to go underwater. Uh, it's not something I would do in my show, in my live show. Uh, I just can't see doing that twice a night. It really was dangerous. I remember when we were taping the trick, when I went under the water and they locked the lid on, the cameras were rolling. I remember thinking to myself, what was I thinking? Why did I ever agree to do this? Okay, Ready, Simon? Yeah. The secret to Harry Houdini's water torture cell is known to only a dozen people in the entire world. American escape artist Bob Fellows is one of the very few performers to present the escape exactly as Houdini did it more than 70 years ago. The illusion of decapitation has always been featured heavily in magic history, especially in the 19th century. Many magicians realized that a baffling illusion, a splash of stage blood, and some genuine risk to life or limb would guarantee a packed theater. Magicians have long known that in a dark and smoky theater, a horrified audience usually cannot perceive that the severed head isn't real. In magic, you don't ask someone to, take a, to look at a stick and pretend it's a sword. In magic, if you see something that looks like a sword on stage, you take that as real, and it's often demonstrated to be real. And when you cut somebody's head off with it, it's, it's quite startling because it looks real. First recorded in ancient Egypt, the decapitation illusion is one of the oldest in the history of magic, and it's still very popular today. to the 16th century book on magic, The Discovery of Witchcraft by Reginald Scott, decapitation was originally used to portray biblical stories, like the beheading of John the Baptist. The trick is such a classic that master magician Lance Burton still performs it in his Las Vegas show. Hey, hey, I want that back. Bring those, hey, I'm gonna need, I'm gonna need those later. 
It consists of a magician removing someone's head and placing it on a table. The disembodied head is still alive and speaks to the magician and to the audience. Okay, let's check in with the patient. Ah, you ain't got nobody! <laughs> well, at least the singing voice has improved. Modern hey. audiences are still entertained by this old illusion. Though nowadays, it's usually performed as a comedy. In the past, magicians embellished their decapitation illusions with graphic storylines and grisly methods. Reenactments of human sacrifices led almost inevitably to public execution by guillotine. In the 1950s, the dramatic lighting, music, and stage presence of South American magician Ricciardi elevated the decapitation illusion to the cutting edge of the art. Ricciardi went on to achieve even greater fame for his presentation of one of the most famous illusions in magic. Sawing a woman in half has been presented in many different forms by many performers. The original version was invented by British magician Percy Tibbles, who used the stage name Selbit. Selbit's simple version consisted of sawing through a box with a woman inside it. It was so popular, it was rapidly copied and elaborated on by other magicians, including American Horace Golden. Golden, rival of Selbit, devised a new method of doing the trick in which the halves of the box were separated. Throughout the trick, the woman's head and feet were visible, making his version that much more convincing. But the large size of box blatantly suggested to the audience the method employed by Golden. An American illusion designer, Guy Jarrett, criticized Golden, claiming he'd done more to damage magic than any other individual. Selbit wasn't discouraged by Golden's improved version, and he resolved to take the illusion to America. Unfortunately, Golden got there first and patented the trick. When Selbit arrived in the States, he found that Golden had sent out several touring companies specifically performing the sawing illusion. By the early 1920s, numerous rival magicians franchised both by Golden and Selbit were sawing ladies in half all over America. The rivalry between the two men continued and even extended on and off stage. Golden kept ambulances, doctors, and nurses in attendance at all his theaters. Selbit countered by employing a man to casually empty a bucket of stage blood into the gutter as theater crowds watched in horror. This rivalry could easily be interpreted as blatant copying. Copyright infringement and creative piracy is still a problem that plagues magicians today. Copyism is not any form of compliment. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery? No. If someone is copying something that you've developed for your act, they're basically stealing your work. And stealing that is, is no more of a compliment than it is if you came to my house and stole my television. Even worse than magicians stealing ideas from each other was the danger that the public might find out how the tricks were done. If the tricks became common knowledge, a lot of magicians would be out of business. Danish-born magician Dante had his own particular way of dealing with spoil sports who tried to reveal his magical secrets. 
During the, the 30s in America, Camel Cigarettes put out an expose in the newspapers on how tricks were done. Dante was working in New York doing Sawing a Woman in Half at the time. And every night, he would go on and prove to them that what they saw in the paper was totally incorrect, and the people would, going out, would go out of the theater saying, I have no idea how that was done. It was exactly what was exposed in the paper, but he was able to condition them and prove to them it wasn't so. Dante performed the sawing illusion throughout his long career, usually with the help of Australian beauty queen Moyo Miller as his assistant. Do you know, the other day I was wondering how many times I had been sawed in half. So I got my little calculator out, and we calculated on a basis of 23 years, one show a night, two shows a night for three years in England, two matinees at least a week, <laughs> and Lord knows how many times we did the four shows and five shows a day during the war years. I came up with 11,800 times. I think that must be pretty near a record. After the Selbit Golden feud, Dante resolved to never allow his act to be copied or plagiarized. It was a very common procedure for people to come into the theater uh, with their little book and pad and uh, so forth and make uh, sketches of different illusions. This was one reason why Dante would never give his okay to have the show photographed, and that's why there is very little on film now of the Dante show. Even though Moyo Miller retired with Dante in the 1950s, she last performed the sawing trick in 1993 for a special magic performance. Dante always said, Sawing a woman in half is not the problem. Anybody can sew a woman in half. The problem is putting it back together again. The sawing illusion has come a long way since the big wooden box days of Golden and Selbit. The thin model sawing is perhaps the best known example in which the box the girl is contained in appears to be very thin, offering no room for another girl to be involved in the performance or any other method the audience might imagine. In fact, it's one of the most baffling versions of the trick ever invented. I believe that magicians have a way of losing track totally of what the idea is behind an illusion that's been around for a long time. And that seems to me what's happened with a sawing in half. Sawing in half is an incredibly brutal idea. And in modern times, about the only other party that I know who's done it with appropriate brutality is the South American magician Ricciardi. <laughs> He would uh, take one of his female assistants, who I believe was one of his daughters, which makes this even more perverse, uh, and she was dressed in a kind of a hospital gown. And he would lay her on a very thin-topped table uh, after apparently uh, putting her under with some sort of anesthetic. He then brought out a huge circular saw, and before the eyes of the audience, ran the circular saw forward, sawing a groove in her right about the hips. Not all the way through, mind you, not a cutesy, oh, let's sever her completely and show the halves, but just a totally, hideously plausible gash about that deep in right about the hips. Incidentally, while he's sawing, there's a wonderful mist of blood that flies out over the audience. Quite appalling. 
uh, he then invited the audience up onto the stage and take a close look. And lo and behold, the next 15 minutes of the show, the audience would come up and almost every single person would want to file past and see what was there. Now, of course, it was an illusion. You know, Ricciardi used to spend much time in abattoirs getting the appropriate interior for this gash. But the audience would come by and gaze in. Simultaneously, two of Ricciardi's assistants would pick up the corpse of the woman, raise her vertically, the front of the gown would fall down in front of her abdomen and there was an enormous, almost menstrual stain in, in front. It was a god-awful, dreadful sight. And the curtain would come down and that was the end of the show. Now there's something to send you home thinking. The public doesn't usually have the loftiest opinion of magicians. And that's because they've often seen very bad ones perform. Uh, they've seen the birthday party magician who screws up his tricks. They've seen the obnoxious stage magician who invites a woman up onto the stage and then makes snide and flirtatious remarks. Uh, they've seen magicians very badly dressed, uh, performing to very bad music and doing highly insulting things. I mean, when you take a woman and stick her in a box, uh, well, first of all, that's rude. And then when you proceed to, to sever that box into several pieces with a large, vicious saw, well, I'm surprised that there aren't feminists picketing every one of those shows. I think deep down within each and every one of us, there's a kind of a, a shadowed sort of desire to push our own boundaries, our own personal boundaries. Some people have different kind of dark secret desires. Some people desire to be controlled. Others have these kind of um, boundaries that they really want to push. And so when they watch these kind of torturous illusions and, and reenactments, uh, it's a way that they can vicariously live through that. They can have those experiences. It's the same reason why we go on roller coasters and bungee jump and, and, and put ourselves through these, you know, ridiculous experiences that like scare the hell out of us because it's a safe way to go into those places, into those corners of ourselves. Gore on stage, and death for that matter on stage, is a celebration of the fact that we can present the image of death. We can look at the apparent image of death and be perfectly safe and happy. All of that stuff is a celebration of life and it's a celebration of art. And it's done in a beautiful red color. One extremely dangerous stage illusion evolved from the infamous game of Russian roulette. A live bullet is loaded into a revolver, the chamber randomly spun and fired at the head of the magician. In theory, a combination of mechanical and sleight of hand methods prevents any chance of an accident occurring. In theory, that is. magician Maurice Fogel believed he had eliminated every element of chance in a trick where six rifles were fired at him at point-blank range. Apparently, using telepathy, he removed the rifle that contained the live round. But more than once, the trick went disastrously wrong. For the rest of his life, Fogel carried the scars of near-fatal calamities. His worst accident